Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. This is us at IHateCritics.net, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, YouTube. Our handle is CriticsPod. Subscribe to the show there. Do the thumbs up on YouTube. Uh, I think you can even subscribe there where you get a notification every time we release an episode. Uh, Patreon, IHateCritics.net slash Patreon. And our merch tab that's there as well. Uh iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or I guess the same thing, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. <laughs> I had an interesting Alexa experience just because I was just curious. I was listening to the show because sometimes I'll do that. And uh, uh, it was just, I didn't know Alexa said the titles. <laughs> so I had to go back through a couple episodes because I had to hear Alexa in the Alexa voice say bright colors and farts. <laughs> and, it, and it was every bit as, as satisfying as I thought it would be. Have you ever, ever have you ever made Alexa fart? <laughs> no, <laughs> you can do that. Yeah, ask Alexa to fart, and she'll do it. Alexa, fart. <laughs> Just I'm doing that to everybody in the. <laughs> I didn't even know you had one in the room. I didn't know I did either. <laughs> so you said it and it started lighting up. I don't know if you could hear that in the background, but Alexa farted. Uh... Nice. <laughs> I, I'll tell my. I got to tell my eight year old goddaughter. She's obsessed with farts. I think it burps too. And <laughs> my brother showed everybody in my family that. <laughs> we it was at a funeral. It was weird. Right. It was awkward. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm not lying. He looked right at my dad and goes, She doesn't queef though. <laughs> and I was just like, Okay. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh,. Before we get to the sub- to the new movies this week, uh, there's a trailer and a little bit of news. I guess the first thing you posted was Ben Affleck's Batman story, why he quit. Yeah, they, he basically, he and the producers kind of decided that it was just going to be too much for him, uh, with given his uh, recent issues that he's had. Well, not recent, but I mean, like, for a long time he's been dealing with uh, an alcohol issue. Uh, that's a big part of what's informing his next movie, The Way Back. Uh, but... They felt that uh, he felt and they felt that uh, putting this much pressure on him uh, when he is this vulnerable was probably not the best way to go. And uh, I thought that was a very I thought it was very brave of him to tell that story because that's a story that a lot of people would try and uh, keep away from people and not not tell. But it's much more inspiring that he puts that out there. It's like, you know what, this, this would probably be too much pressure for me to take right at this moment. Right. I mean – one, you're not going to satisfy everybody for sure. You already have people kind of shitting on you and, you know, bat fluck, this and that. Uh, yeah, I can, that, that's a good decision. It wasn't just the producers and him, it was his friends. There was a lot yeah. of people involved. So that's a cool story. And obviously, it's, I hate to say it's good PR for the new movie, but it, I mean, it is, or it's not good, but it, it's, it's just news that goes with the new movie that's coming out. And yeah. On top of that, he's got a movie on Netflix that, that I just noted right before we hit record, so we'll probably talk about that next week. Uh, so I don't know. It's so great you can't even remember the name of it. <laughs> I wrote it down though. I found out <laughs> the last thing he wanted. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the main star I think is Anne Hathaway, uh-huh. uh, and I just literally started it. Briefly. I am not even a little bit aware of this. It's a Netflix movie. does a really crappy job of telling people about their movies outside of the award season. Yeah, people go and still see them. I mean, it's crazy. All it takes is... Even the new movies, that, like The Horse Girl, we I had to go look for. It wasn't up there, mm-hmm. I know, until a couple of days after it had been out. So I don't know. It's just... And they're, you they're stumbled different. across that because you were listening to other... You were listening to podcasts, right? Either that... I think I saw it on Instagram first, and then uh, Allison Brie was on Chris Hardwick's podcast, I think after the fact, but... Either way, I mean, that's I wasn't from Netflix. <laughs> I think maybe it was Mark Duplass on Instagram. So it's yeah. something about, this is a weird one. <laughs> but uh, Wonderfully so. so. Yeah. Uh, and then David O. Russell. I, I haven't read what you posted, but Margot Robbie, Christian Bale. Is it done or are they just starting it? I think they're just starting it. I think they're just getting underway. But it's great to see him. Back in action, and it's uh, been a while. Hasn't yeah, it? it's American Hustle, or was there one after that? I think it was. Yeah, I think the last one was American Hustle. Now that wow. I think about, it. well, no, was American Hustle before? That was after Silver Linings Playbook, right? 
Yeah, it was after. Yeah. Thrilling's playbook was before we started the podcast, I think. And then that year, I think, we, it maybe, I don't know, it was right around the same time we started. So it's he's only had two movies. Since. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd be, like to see him do more. Yeah. But, yeah, I'm excited about that. And then there's a trailer out, Run. Run, with uh, Sarah Paulson is the star, and uh, alongside a young lady uh, whose name, of course, would escape me now, but... Uh, she's going to be the first person in a wheelchair to actually star in a movie. Like, she's legitimately in a wheelchair. This has never happened before where somebody in a wheelchair stars in a movie. They've been in movies, but the actual star of a movie is interesting. Uh, but the movie's called Run, and it stars Sarah Paulson as a mother who's very obsessed with her daughter. And to the point where the daughter begins to have visions of the word run everywhere she goes, like trying to get... And she's, you know, either she's kind of mentally ill herself or she's kind of uh, under the influence of something. The, the, it's very unclear. But uh, interestingly enough, the, the thing that really interests me is that this comes from the writer, producer, director team behind Searching. And uh, Anish Chaganti is, a, is an interesting director, a very experimental. Searching was a, a daring and different kind of movie with the, this, the whole setting being inside of a computer, essentially. being right. a, The whole thing on a webcam. Uh, that had a lot of the benefit of having John Cho, but still, uh, very entertaining movie, very engaging, very interesting. And so I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see where they go. This seems a lot less experimental, uh, than searching was seems a lot more straightforward and a little overly familiar <laughs> in terms of just the thriller kind of setup that they have. Right. But it's a Mother's Day release and I, I don't know, it's worth a shot. <laughs> You cannot escape a mother's love is the tagline. Oh, it's stupid. <laughs> I didn't watch the trailer in case you had to. <laughs> we would have watched it beforehand, but my kid threw a drumstick through the TV. So. Oh, lovely. So watching streaming might be challenging next week, but I'll figure it out. Um, this, this movie, the trailer has another thing that really kind of bugs me about Hollywood, and that is... D- defining people being uh, either mentally ill or not living in Los Angeles and New York by the fact that they have bad hair. So Sarah Paulson's got this, like, really frizzy, stringy hair. And it's just, you have to look at that and go, either either she's mentally ill or Midwestern. One or the other, it's mentally ill or Midwestern, because that's how Hollywood works. That is very true. <laughs> or could she be both? Or what? <laughs> very well could be both, yes. That's funny. Uh... Call of the Wild. We'll start there. All right. Uh, number one movie. That, well, Sonic, not number one, but Call of the Wild was right there. did better than they thought it was going oh, yeah. to. It was beating Sonic for a while. I mean, it, it's surprising because there's really, who do you recommend this movie to? I don't really know how to recommend this movie. I can't because I don't think it's very good <laughs> overall. But honestly, it's not a kid's movie. It's. It, I think kids like kids like your age kids are going to be like squirming in their seats because they're kind of bored by it. Really? And then adults, I mean... Harrison Ford, I guess, is appealing for an older audience, but older audiences are going to see what I saw, which is this dog that looks like a CGI dog. It looks like this ropey, like, uh, bad CGI dog, because it is, because the dog's not real. Uh, the dog is essential, is a uh, uh, Cirque du Soleil performer wearing, like, a, one of those CGI motion capture suits and being a dog. And it's so incredibly unnatural that it ruined the entire movie. Uh, this is based on Jack, L- Jack London's novel, but a really dumbed-down version of it. Uh, they, they're trying to make it PG, which they did. Uh, the novel is not necessarily PG. It's not R-rated or anything, but it's not PG. It's got some violent elements to it, a lot more violent elements than this, and some more rugged, rugged elements than this does. Uh, the dog is a dog of privilege. It's uh, living in this very nice high-end neighborhood, the dog of a judge in a California town. He gets kidnapped and taken to the Yukon where it ends up on a dog sled team for a, a mail delivery guy uh, played by Simon Sai, I think his name Sai is his last name. And he, Omar Sai. Uh, he was in uh, a wonderful movie that was actually the basis for that Kevin Hart, Brian Cranston movie, The, uh, oh, the okay. Untouchables. Um, wonderful actor. He's really great. Uh, but again, we're talking about him having to act opposite a guy in a motion capture suit pretending to be a dog, and it just kind of looks silly. <laughs> and every that guy, and not to knock the guy, he, he does the best he possibly could, I'm sure, in this motion capture suit trying to be a dog. But 
there's so much misguided, so many mu- other misguided elements. Like he just doesn't look right. Uh, and then the size of the dog is very odd. Like it's, it's supposed to be, they make it out to be like this 500 pound, six foot long dog. And it's not, it looks like a, when you look at it, it's a regular sized dog, but then everybody's treating it like it's the, this is the biggest dog we've ever seen. Well, no, not really. <laughs> Does it change in size? Like It seems to. I was going to say in the trailer, it looked yeah. like at times it was huge and other times it wasn't, but I didn't go see the movie, obviously. Yeah, it, it, it does seem to change size and it's weird. Like, uh, yeah. There's a scene where Harrison Ford is is like getting into a boat with the dog. It's this tiny little boat, and the dog gets in, and the boat like jumps up in the air, and it's like <laughs> the dog isn't that. It's a Saint Bernard. It's a pretty typical like Saint Bernard looking dog. Like <laughs> I don't know how big a Saint Bernard typically gets, but <laughs> well, right. I mean, they get to be big dogs, but I mean, if it sticks out as the biggest dog of all time, then it's, <laughs> when it's just a regular Saint Bernard, that's not. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. So Buck, there's a. There's an allegory here to – I'm going to stretch this very thin, but I'm going to do it. Uh, this is essentially the Bernie Sanders of dogs. He's like a democratic socialist of dogs on this post office trip. So he's he finally, for the first time since he's been kidnapped, he's being treated kindly. He's not being hit. He's not being – and solely he becomes part of the pack and becomes a leader by – he does so by – giving everything away so he catches a fish but he gives it to everybody and he's you know he's sharing while it's the other dog the lead dog the current lead dog is a dick who's keeping everything for himself and is you know constantly having to show his dominance and buck wins everybody over by being nice to everybody and giving everybody giving everything away it's an allegory for democratic socialism uh (laughs) yeah that's really thin It's, it works. He's but not the most likable guy either. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is. But uh, I think even Harrison Ford has actually mentioned this as being kind of a uh, a political movie in that way, and uh, and it certainly gets that way because later on in the movie, uh, he finally enters the story. He's the narrator throughout, so you're hearing his voice throughout. But Harrison Ford, physically in the film, doesn't fully enter the movie until more than halfway through. So there's kind of a, a lie there in the, uh, in throughout. He's like, it's not him all the way. Uh, you spend a lot, just as much time with Omar Sy and his partner than you, as you do with Harrison Ford. That doesn't surprise me knowing what I know about him. <laughs> there's a scene late in the movie where he and Buck have gone off and they found their own little paradise. And it's just the two of them. And they're just hanging out and they're finding gold in the river and they find just more gold than anybody knows what to do with. And to a point where when, when, when they get ready to leave, Harrison Ford is like tossing some of the gold back into the, back into the river and says, really, you only really need enough to pay, to pay for groceries for the rest of your life. That's really all you need. You don't need to have everything. So he's just tossing gold back into the river, <laughs> which I, I like. I mean, that certainly that's a message that resonates with me well, no, I and my politics. At the same time, it's punching you in the face. <laughs> right. And it doesn't resonate to everybody. So it's just like. <laughs> a lot of people are rolling their eyes going, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> right. Because what if you get hurt and you need to go to the doctor and I need more than groceries? <laughs> I mean, surprisingly, it got good reviews. I mean, it got like sixty three. I mean, it was fresh on Rotten yeah. Tomatoes. Not like I can. I guess I can see it. Like uh, most of the elements of it are good. Like Omar Sy is good. Harrison Ford is good. The dog, though, is the center of the movie, and it looks like crap. It looks doesn't look like a dog. It doesn't move like a dog. It has this it has a big smile on its face. It looks weird. <laughs> it's so awkward and uncomfortable. It looks so bad in the trailer, and I mean, quite frankly, the book bore me to tears when I yeah. was a kid. So I don't. <laughs> my son really wanted to see it, but luckily we were out of town, so we couldn't. Uh, <laughs> but I, but it surprised everybody. At one point, it, it was predicted to be ahead of Sonic, so I think at the last minute, Sonic came back. I mean, twenty five million. Sonic did twenty six. Yeah, I mean, they didn't predict much for this movie, so it's a big victory for them, I guess. Although, I have no idea what they spent on this movie. That level of CGI, you got to figure they spent a lot. $135 million. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, they're, they're looking at maybe, I mean, it depends on how it does overseas. They're, it's only $40 million worldwide so far. I mean, that's talking about maybe break-even. <laughs> maybe they expect it to just 
make money its entire life. Like, just keep making money on streaming. I don't know. I can't. Uh, whatever. I don't know. If you want to watch a dog movie, and if you're really interested in watching a good dog movie in this type of vein, Togo on Disney Plus is incredible. That's Willem Dafoe in the story of... Uh, uh, like taking apart the, the legend of Balto, essentially to, like destroying that. This was the actual dog, <laughs> which is kind of fun. And it's really well made and it has an actual dog in it. <laughs> and that really does make a big difference because they found a dog that was very well trained that could do be charming and funny in a way that a dog is charming and funny, the way we all love dogs, you know? Uh, it's got a personality as a dog. As opposed to this, which is a human being trying to project a personality through motion capture dog, and it doesn't work. Yeah, it's like, have you ever seen those original like drawings of Shrek where that everybody looks at and like, right. uh, that two Uncanny Valley, get that out of here, that horrific thing? That's kind of what this dog is. It lives right there in that awful Uncanny Valley. <laughs> I can't think of any dog movies I really like. I mean, maybe there's dogs in movies I like, but... I liked Marley and Me. Yeah, I guess but I didn't see it. <laughs> I think because, I, I, again, it was one of those low expectation things where I was going in thinking this is going to be treacle. <laughs> and it, came, it rose above the bar of treacle. Right. And, you know, it's not afraid to go where it went, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so I suppose I could watch that one if I needed to watch a dog movie. <laughs> I was going to say Lethal Weapon's probably my favorite dog movie, but he's hardly in it. <laughs> Uh, or maybe Lethal Weapon 3 when he's <laughs> trying to talk. Uh, Brahms, The Boy 2. Yeah, this is weird. I, how did this even get a sequel? It's baffling to me. I guess it must have cost like $3 to make the first one, and that's how they took the profits from that and made, a, made another one. And they got a bigger star, which is bizarre, because Katie Holmes is certainly a bigger star than whoever was in the first one. I think it was one of the Game of Thrones people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. Um, the boy, uh, too, is, uh, the, the character, the, the, the doll Brahms was, uh, of the first movie was part of the, uh, a family that had lived in this ancient home and the doll kind of controlled the house, uh, and this little boy and kind of got into this little boy's soul to the point where the boy began hiding in the walls and grew up to be an adult. And so they explained everything that the doll did, not as some supernatural thing, but as something that this guy who lived in the walls did. Or maybe it was supernatural also because the doll was controlling him. So unclear and so sloppy that it was so bad. <laughs> and so we end up now, somehow we have a sequel where a more modern family is moving into a home that's on the same grounds as this old home. And they've got a little boy who's troubled and he's got a troubled backstory because his mom was just attacked by... Uh, robbers. She survived, but uh, she was beat up in the process, and he witnessed the whole thing and has gone mute. Um, he finds this doll, and suddenly he begins to develop more of his personality and even begins to talk again. So the doll's great, right? Well, no, not really, because the doll's really super creepy. <laughs> it's old. It wears a suit. Its head seems to turn on its own. It's porcelain, and it, porcelain dolls are always creepy in movies, and really in real life, real, too. real life, too, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, this time they do really heavily intimate that it's got some kind of supernatural power. Uh, or is it that the mom is you know, mentally ill herself? There's aspects of that. Katie Holmes at least elevates the material. Uh, it's just shitty material, so it can be elevated very much. And we get a very typical, very you know, nothing too surprising horror movie. There's just nothing exciting or new or different about it, other than Katie Holmes is a really good actress. It been better if she was attacked by Scientologists. <laughs> <laughs> That's the allegory, actually. The, the, the porcelain doll's Tom Cruise. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, this one cost $10 million to make, and it's already at 8 worldwide. So, so Brown's I've seen the Boy no, 3? I've seen no trailers for it, so there's probably <laughs> no real money spent on advertising. There's a sequel tease, so. Oh, great. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, it was in the top 10, but not kind of down, like, what, 6th? 5th place. No, it's was bad boys it's fourth place right fourth behind place. uh harley quinn uh and then at 11th place the impractical jokers movie if you want to call it that <laughs> <laughs> to me this is like 
watching Tenacious D or the new Jay and Silent Bob, it's not really a movie. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Because it's not. Uh, it's just basically fan service for the fans of the show. Only, only, only fans of the show. Because I was completely. I don't. I don't give a damn about this at all. <laughs> Yeah, I love the show. Don't get me wrong. I uh, I was kind of annoyed. Uh, so this whole thing is, for some reason, they decided to take this show. That the show is just the pranks, right? That's all they do is the pranks, or do they have a storyline that runs through? I mean, it's, they have the pranks, and then the loser does a challenge at the end. So it's there's a you know it's they have two to three pranks, and then the loser, whoever can't do what they're supposed to do, does this crazy challenge based on what their fears are and stuff like that. And it's pretty neat, pretty smart. Here, they try to make a story with it, which, okay, I mean, they didn't try it. I mean, they were intentionally making it stupid. You could tell. <laughs> uh, but then when the pranks came, they kind of rushed them. Like They did, yeah. I, even I some, can sense that, and I've never seen the show. There were some, like... One of the characters, Sal, is afraid of, desperately afraid of cats. And they literally lock him in a hotel room with a tiger. And it's they kind of wasted that. Because in the show, that would have been hilarious. <laughs> I mean, they just lock him in a room with cats, and it's funny. And then they, they tease the tiger once, and then didn't do it. Here, it just kind of happens, and it's really quick. It's really fast, and there was no buildup to it. He just walks around, there's a tiger, and you see him scream. You kind of need the backstory from being afraid of cats. For even to be funny, but even then, it was just like the kind of waste of this. Yeah. The framing device is terrible, just god awful. It, I know Paul it's intentionally Abdul. bad, but I couldn't tell what the joke was. Do they it actually like Paul Abdul? Do they hate Paul Abdul? Is she in on the joke? Is she not in on the joke? The joke is that they're friends since high school. They really were. That's kind of. <laughs> it's not even a joke. It's just. <laughs> They needed to take him back to high school, who was popular when they were in high school, Paul Abdul. They, it felt like she could have been the fifth choice, of, and they could have subbed in anybody from that time period and done the same jokes. I think you needed somebody who would say yes. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, though. Like They could have passed. Four of the people could have said, no, I'm not doing that. They could have been on more than four. <laughs> I mean, it could have been from any genre, any movie, any, you know, any really place in entertainment. Just who's, and Paul Abdul's like at that perfect CD level of <laughs> where it would work and, or not that it would work, that no, she would do it. it doesn't work because it doesn't make any sense whether or not, I can't tell if they're actually, if they actually like her or if they're being dicks. Like, I can't, I don't know. I would assume they're not being dicks. They're not but being dicks. They, but it kind of, it comes off that way kind of because they, it comes off as both as as likable and mocking at the same time and it's hard to I can't figure out where it is and it's just it annoyed the hell out of me uh, and that she's the one who sets the plot in motion where she hands them a group uh, she, she hands them this group of passes to a party in Miami but there's only three of them so they've got to do a bunch of pranks and then at the end the, whoever doesn't do enough pranks I guess does they Whoever loses the pranks Basically, you have challenges. It's not just the pranks. You have to, if you're afraid to say something, you get a thumbs down. If you say it, you get a thumbs up. That is not well established. No, if it, you're not a fan of the show, you don't like watch me. Because I I had no idea what this particular scoring system was. How they decided who won or who lost. I had no clue. They just rush. I mean, usually on the show, they all do the same pranks. And to me, the best part of the movie, there was two good things that I liked: the job interview for the Atlanta Hawks. I thought was funny. Because they spent time with that. Everybody did it. They kind of explained what was going on. But at that point, you're almost an hour in. And then right after that, Q had to give a, a speech where his, he, was, he was watching his parents do softcore porn, which was funny. But again, they didn't really set that up either. No, because there's only one of them doing it. And it, right. you're just kind of going, well, why, why is it just the one of them doing it? Shouldn't they all have a, something similar or... How is that a challenge? How is that? Like, how does well, he, it's just embarrassing. I, <laughs> That's what ha- Like at the end of the episodes, usually they have the. It's more of a punishment, and yeah. something like that would be the punishment where you're up there. All right, now you got to give this presentation on this, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> Uh, so that's usually a more of a punishment than a prank because there is no... That would make more sense than how it's presented here, which is just sort of random. It's kind of funny, but 
eh. Those are the two funniest things the, in the whole movie. For, for me, me, the the one that that I think exists outside of the movie could, that could be really funny is they take the character of Murr on his birthday to a strip club in Atlanta. They cover him in strippers, and then they open up a <laughs> they open up a curtain, and there's his entire extended family. That one worked for me. That made me laugh. I thought that was it's very short, but it the the it's so such a simple setup. It, it worked for me. Right. It just. But it's still the fact that it was just rushed. It just happened and yeah. it came out of nowhere. And like the, the one mean, that I couldn't stand, and the one that was just driving me nuts was this: they just decide we're going to pull the car over and pretend there's something wrong, something wrong with the car, and then they're just talking to random people who come by to be helpful, and they're just being like, uh, "Okay, walk him around the car three times. Okay, get him go around the car again." I'm like, Ugh, "Just let him, let the guy leave. Just go." My God, it was it was interminable. That that bit that was the one that went on forever. <laughs> it felt like it went on forever. And it, yeah, I mean, nothing particularly funny happened there. I mean, I obviously what they do is they bring real people in, and that's part of the whole gag. And then when they find out afterwards, they never show it really. But uh, the, the, just to, just an example of how up its own ass this movie is. The the, the Paul Abdul thing again. The, the, in the setup portion, she has a whole thing about season five sucked. Like, okay, is this this is somehow universal knowledge that season five of Impractical Jokers, this random show that that uh, uh, like a million people watch, the se- the fifth season sucked of ten. <laughs> Come on, that is such that is so bizarrely obscure. Well, I mean, and it did was, it suck? I don't. <laughs> Not really. I mean, there it's basically like any show. I mean, it's probably the funniest show on TV, in my opinion. I mean, mm-hmm. there's some of the things they've done that, it, like, one of the punishments is Q has to go to a ch- children's baseball game. They have a kid planted on the field, and he has to taunt his kid <laughs> around all these other parents. And it's painfully awkward, but you know people are in on it, so it's, I don't know. It's just, and then, I don't know, they just do a bunch of funny things but then there are things that just fall short but there's enough of it that i mean these guys go and play arenas around the country they sell out (laughs) madison square garden and it's not overly funny like i I went to the show once it's fine but it is definitely they they have their audience and they're they're it's very safe but i mean their audience showed up they had like 300 screens and made two million dollars so that's pretty i mean they were the highest per theater average uh of the week with anybody over 300 at least i think there was a couple that had like one theater and made like 80 grand <laughs> but <laughs> i mean it, i was hoping for a little more because i if you just did a longer version of the show that would have been fine I mean, why not <laughs> and something like that you could have possibly won someone like you over who probably never seen it yeah. you know what i'm saying instead I mean, just you t- tried give to give me three big episodes with your three biggest ideas you know Right. I mean, the last, they just had episode 200, and the way they ended it was the band Steel Panther. They stuck Murr inside the bass drum during the whole concert. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> uh, but and he had Kevin Smith, Jane Silent Bob, one of the sketches, they were on it, where yeah. they had to get someone to untangle some headphones before they were to pants by Jane Silent Bob. I mean, it wasn't that funny, but you got to see Jane Silent Bob <laughs> pop up. Uh, but, I mean, it came out, it came here. Uh, didn't go a lot of places. I saw a lot of people complaining it didn't come out. I was, yeah, I find the I find the release uh, on this to be a little bit odd. But they do. I mean, they've played here multiple times, yeah. so that could be. Maybe they know their markets. I don't know. Maybe I I don't know. I thought I thought it was a fathom event. I didn't even think it was going to get a, a nationwide release. Well, and one thing they did. One thing that I think is cool about it is they literally sent the four guys out to different theaters to do pres- You know, to show the movie. And I think that really helped with the success of it. And, I mean, it kind of shows if you have, you know, if you get a diehard enough fan base, you could do something like this. And at the same time, with what they do, they have to remain kind of niche so people aren't recognizing them constantly. You'd be amazed. Though. That's part of the joke. There's been times where they're doing the show, yeah, and they'll be like, you know what, this kind of reminds me of. You ever seen that show on Practical Jokers? And there'll be like two of them. They'll be like, no, what is that show? And then they'll. Then the other two will walk out behind the guy, and then he'll actually pull. There's, he's literally pulling the show up on his phone, showing him, and then he looks around and goes, "Oh, I'm on the show." <laughs> and that happens like four or five times on the show. That's how they get away with it. 
Uh, I don't know. It's just I, I like the show a lot. The movie was for the fans and not even. I mean, I didn't love it. But there was parts that I, I mean, I, that whole job interview thing, I was like crying, laughing. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of the character Q because he does that podcast. Tell him Steve Day. So watching him do that presentation, I mean, I got to bring a little to that. So yeah. it was funny to watch his parents literally starting a. The beginning of a softcore porno while he's on <laughs> so he's stage. Been, he's being positioned as this uh, as this social, social media, media influencer, and he's going to speak at this social media conference with, in front of people who have no idea who he is, and he's now suddenly the keynote speaker, and he's going to do a, essentially just a very typical you know PowerPoint presentation about what it means to be a social media influencer. But each time he he clicks the thing to to, to a different uh, uh, PowerPoint, it it warps out and it becomes something like a, a videotape that got taped over and it's his mom and dad having sex which is setting up in softcore porn scenarios but where, where i think the movie messes up though is i don't know i mean you tell me it looked staged to you didn't like you don't know that q's not in on you can't really tell i mean they try to pretend but it's not as obvious on them in the movie that they're not in t- on on the jokes as in the show like in the show you know you know, it's way more funny because it doesn't appear staged at all. I yeah. mean, literally what happened for that one, they had one day off. Murph flew back to Staten Island, filmed this, or Pennsylvania, wherever his parents live, filmed that scene, came back. Q had no idea what was happening. And it's, the backstory is so much funnier. I, I don't know. I just. Speaking of the character of Murr, what were those little interstitials about him? Like, do they, is that an in-joke in the show that he's weird and has weird hobbies that they're not aware of? Because that's a becomes this running gag throughout the movie that he's got all these weird things that he does that the other guys don't seem to be aware of. No, not really. He's the. I mean, he's <laughs> the, the one that make fun of the most. Yeah. Uh, the one that they pretend not to like, but which is why they throw his luggage out every time. <laughs> which, I mean, it, it, I guess okay, it's kind of funny, I suppose, but not really. I mean, it didn't add... And all those scenes, to me, are things you cut and spend more time building up the, the pranks and stuff yeah. to make it more funny. I mean, even at the they end... they weren't funny. <laughs> not, a, not a one of them was funny. I mean, he's, one time he's in his hotel room teaching a spin class, then another time he's having a party with old people. And, and it was like a bu- bubble party in yeah. another one, or, whatever, I don't know, or a foam party, whatever they're called. Yeah. Yeah, it was just kind of... I think they he's kind of more the loner of the group. Uh I don't even know if that's the He just kind of has a, he wrote he wrote a book that did really pretty well. He just kind of does his own thing. Sal and Q are like really good friends and Joe's kind of the one who keeps it all together. So I maybe I don't know. I, I'm not What was the what was the deal with the cave bit? I mean, did I, Another thing that could have been funny that they just kind of threw out there. Yeah. It's similar to the Q thing. And, it's uh, not, there's a bit with a cave where he plays a guy who invades a, this tour of a cave somewhere. And he pretends to be a guy who's been lost since the 1980s. And it just never becomes funny beyond, I guess, he looks like the, the makeup basically is the funniest part. And the... Uh, Right. And his T-shirt. They make a big deal about the T-shirt. Said something from the '80s, I guess. Yeah, I'm the beef or whatever. I'm the beef. And it's again, it probably could have been funny if you, if there was some sort of reasoning behind it, or if all four of them did it and they had a, I don't know, they were just, just. It was just Joe doing it, and just that's that's the funny part of it, and. But I mean, it comes down to if you like those guys, whoever your favorite is, yeah. that's, you're going to like those. To set up further, the premise of this is that the the guy is out there doing a thing in front of people who don't know he's doing a thing. Everybody else is an IFB in his ear, telling him to say horrific things. And if he can't say the horrific thing that he's being asked to say, he loses the challenge. Right? More or less, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's really funny. Other times it's not. And. I mean, just like anything else. But when it's funny, it's as funny as it can get. But in the movie, it just sound they they try to make it too tight, and it just didn't work. I think uh, the the one thing that I did enjoy is that they do focus on people who are extraordinarily kind, like, and they not they're not mean to these people no. in any way. There's zero meanness, which I appreciate. There's not this is not at the expense of the people that they're talking to in any way. It's it's at their own expense for the most part. 
Uh, and and what they focus on is demonstrating just how incredibly kind people are in putting up with whatever bullshit that these guys are putting out there. Which I, I did I did admire that most people, um, you know, like the jackass guys don't do that when they're just doing their thing. Where like they're playing the pranks where they're like shitting in things and running, you know, knocking things over in a store. Uh, right. You know, that's they're they're being just dicks. But I don't think these guys are just are just being dicks. They do have uh, one prank where they knock things over in a store, but the store is in on it. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they have to convince they'll st- have a stack of like cereal boxes or something like that. And they got to convince someone to cover for them while they dive into it and pretend they got injured so they can sue the store. <laughs> and no one ever, no one ever falls for it. Uh, but I don't know. I thought it was neat that they were able to. They found a way to make it successful. Definitely, basically, like the Tenacious D movie and even the new Jane Silent Bob. You really can't call it a movie. It's so for the fans that it's that it's almost it doesn't matter what the criticism is. <laughs> Uh, and good for them for ha- doing something for their fans, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to our classic. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear, legitimate, and universally recognized, undisputed classic. Eggshells. Yeah, <laughs> eggshells. Boy, do I. <laughs> I regret this choice. <laughs> I love Toby Hooper, and and I I understand that there are elements of this that are, you know, indicative of the style that comes to make Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But this is this is hard. This is hard to get through. This is a student movie uh, that has no plot, no characters. It's just a series of trippy visuals, like some seriously heavy hippie shit going on, and. Man, I just, I just can't, I just can't with hippies. I just can't. <laughs> it's only an hour and a half, if that, and there's at least fifteen minutes, maybe twenty, of montage. Yeah. And I mean, the was, first ten was minutes. Was there a story? Not I, really. I, I'm trying. I tried. I had to turn it off after a certain point, and you made me go back and watch the ending. That's pretty much it. I, I missed. A I just wanted of to because it. Cause it <sighs> I had watched I tried to do a deep dive. I couldn't find anything. Like I tried to go on YouTube and find people that reviewed it and like the f- only person I found had a hard target poster behind him so he didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> uh and I even watched uh an Alamo thing where I don't even know if it was Alamo, it was somewhere in Austin, probably was Alamo Draft House, where Toby Hooper did a screening and then it did a QA afterwards. Yeah. And I had to go back and watch that final scene too, because I didn't remember it. Uh I remember the car blowing up, but uh and he kind of explained what happened. It was the hippies becoming one with nature and one with the earth. But at the same time it was supposed to be like it was possible aliens and the house was kinda haunted, but they don't uh. really go into anything. I can see as a theatrical experience, like if you're trapped in that room and you're not going anywhere, I could see where this could work on you. Oh, if yeah. You're like just just give yourself over to it as an experience, like a Terrence Malick movie. Uh, if you're in the theater, it really works. If you're outside the theater and you're trying to watch it, you're going to turn it off and walk away because you're bored. And I'll defend Terrence Malick as much as I'm usually the guy going after him. At least he's. 30, 40, 50, you know, however old he is right. into his career. This is his first movie. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, that said, like, it is trippy. It is artistic. It's, you know, it's very original. It's, uh, I don't know what it's about other the, than I think it's just hippies being hippies. I, I watched the final 10 minutes at your at your request because I, I turned it off, I don't know, about 35 minutes in because <laughs> I was so annoyed. Uh and I got to say that the, there's a moment where there's a guy sitting, I think, in a typewriter and 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 the, it suddenly takes on like a Texas Chainsaw vibe a little bit. And visually, you know, the cues are there from the visuals. And I'm like, OK, that's interesting. And then the car drives for like three minutes. And I'm like, OK, it's the brown money now. <laughs> like, right. You just get, do something. Uh, but there's this. Like everybody starts getting a, a perm for some reason, and then they take the thing that's like the perm thing, and they put it out in the, the in the in nature, and then they put trash bags over their heads, and they get sucked up into it, 
and then they credits roll, and then they get spit out the back end like they're just they're dripped into nature. And I thought, well, I I get I get what that's the the symbolism there is very easy to understand. I I get that like uh, the 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 hippies are being consumed and 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 uh, and put into the earth like that. Like maybe this is the, the beginning of the end or something. Right. And if this was a better movie, it could be the nice. It, you know, your whole Nashville, Texas chance thing could really work here with that. Or that could be the one in between that. But, but like, I, I get where this kind of goes, though, within the influencing Texas Chainsaw. Oh, yeah. Because you've got kind of the, not a hopefulness to this, but sort of the, it captures the chaos that, that he's experienced in, in 69 that's going to inform the anger and the, and the violence that comes about in Texas Chainsaw. So I definitely saw that. Uh, and especially, at least at that ending there. Right. The other stuff is just so far up its own ass. Well, and that's the thing is, even in time, mean, like the acting isn't your typical acting. I mean, it's definitely low budget acting, but it's almost like people just being. It's not yeah. even real acting. But the way he got, I mean, in watching the Q and A's, the way he's got in both movies, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and this, he would do like 60, 70, 80 takes to get them to stop acting and just start being and to get that documentary feel to it, which yeah. I would have guessed he just did this one day <laughs> based on, I mean, it, the acting's fine. It's not bad by any means. It's just, there's not a lot of it. Cause there's so many montages and art, art shots and weird edits Rooms and that paint themselves and a weird guy sword fighting. I don't know if you saw that part or not. Yeah. Does he like sword fight himself or something? Which it, it just kind of happens. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of nudity. Uh, the cast. Oh, I missed the nudity. <laughs> there's one point where there, there's a lot of it. You missed. Did you see the car blow up or no? Uh, was that the final ten minutes? It might have been right before the final ten minutes. I only watched he the final ten. Blows minutes. a car up, or he lights a car on fire, takes off all his clothes. I mean, it's male nudity. Yeah. Throws all his clothes in the car, starts running away, and the car just explodes. And. I don't know. They got a bunch of shots of it exploding. It almost looks like a mini nuclear bomb. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, I don't know. Again, I think you're right. In the theater, it would probably be more, uh, You'd there'd be something to experience there at least. Because there's a lot of weird, uh, I can't think what the word is, the whatever, uh, abstract yeah. shots and stuff that mean nothing. But I don't know. I tried to find something there and... Every review I read of it was people who saw it, like in its initial screening, right. who happened to be friends with the cast and stuff. So, <laughs> uh, and Austin people who are, you know, Austin people believe everything Austin is great. And this was apparently the first, you know, the first movie made in Austin or something like that, or the first, I don't know, they did, there was a whole thing about before, you know, a couple of the, maybe it was it Slackers or whatever, before this, before that, before Texas Chance Massacre was Eggshells, the yeah. first movie to, I don't know, be shot there. But, I don't know. Did you watch the other one, Spontaneous Combustion? I did. Was that on YouTube? Yeah. yeah. I had trouble finding it this morning when I had time to watch movies. You could but- look at our... Facebook page oh, my phone because <laughs> I linked everything right there I had on a our hard Facebook time page. getting my Facebook to work on my phone so I was stuck <laughs> in a instead I watched a movie about softball like squeeze play I think it was from the 80s about girls who decide softball's for them and they take on the guys at the end <laughs> what the hell you know one of those 80s TNA movies <laughs> <laughs> which is weird is like I don't know like the whole premise is all of our '80s movies or '90 movies were were on our Facebook page. <laughs> oh, not all of them. I, I guess. searched I, them all. I just all couldn't but get two them of them. I think I can't. Remember. I know I posted three of them. They were they were there, and I watched I watched two of them for sure. I'll you know, they do remind me what the '90 movies are. <laughs> well, we can start with spontaneous combustion. Yeah, because it's Toby Hooper directed and. Uh, Interestingly, this is a, a very interesting movie uh, because it's very much influenced. You can definitely sense the the influence of a generation here that grew up in the nuclear age. The idea here is that this uh, this couple was used for testing the nuclear bomb. They were put in a bomb shelter and they wanted to see uh, if they had if this cure that they have for for uh, nuclear exposure would work. So they put this couple in this in this uh, bomb shelter. They dropped the nuclear bomb on them, like a, a, a bikini atoll, and to see how they 
react to it. And they give them this serum. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, what they don't know at that time is that the girl had somehow, during that time, gotten pregnant. They had hoped that they wouldn't do that. <laughs> but you can't lock a, a young wo- man and a young woman, a husband and wife, in a small spot for a long period of time and expect them not to have sex. So they end up having a baby. Uh, they get pregnant while they're down there. She's pregnant when they get hit by the bomb and uh, take in the cure. And uh, she manages to give birth, but then immediately after giving birth, she spontaneously combusts. And the husband spontaneously combusts. And uh, the baby is saved, but grows up uh, to be, what's that guy's name, the character actor? Is it Brad Dourif? I think it's Brad Dourif. I think it was going to be like Michael Berryman or something. (laughs) Grows up to be Brad Dourif. He's a relatively normal guy growing up. Uh, Has a relatively normal life going on. I think he's a professor or something. And uh, he doesn't know about his parentage until he gets to a particular age when he starts to develop odd symptoms. And uh, one of the odd symptoms is that he's shooting fire out of himself. (laughs) <laughs> and there are other people who apparently there are others in this same scenario who are also born in this way and they're having similar symptoms where they are spontaneously combusting and the government is trying to cover it up and uh, study them at the same time but also kind of keep them from anybody from finding out about them so finding out that they are testing on people and that's the, that's the story essentially he's he's beginning to spontaneously combust but he's also kind of learning that he's also kind of super powered so he can use his firepower to kill people if he needs to but he's the hero so he's not tr- he doesn't want to heal he's only using it this firepower <laughs> to yeah to kill the villains essentially and protect the, the people that he cares about but at the same time he's also dealing with the fact that he can't entirely control it so he's spitting fire here and there uh <laughs> this it works this movie kind of works in a weird way it's kind of charming in its way it's very low budget uh the the effects are really goofy looking uh but i i love the idea of a guy who's just randomly shooting fire out of himself it's kind of a that's a really clever idea <laughs> Yeah, I just I wish I could get the Facebook page to work on my phone. I just this morning I could not get it to pull up. Yeah, and I did search it, but I kept getting like human combustion and shit like that, and I <laughs> I just it never popped up. And I searched Tubi and Netflix and Amazon, and I could not get it anywhere. Yeah, and all the time was sitting right there on our Facebook. I, couldn't get I think to it, it. I think it actually got taken down actually because I went to look for it again uh, in my history today just to, for whatever reason and it wasn't there, so maybe it got taken down. Well, I saw it just a little. Early when I got home, yeah. But in this morning, I couldn't find, I couldn't get anything to pull up. Uh, but I'm, I want to see it. I might still take a shot at it because I do like Toby Hooper too. I've never actually seen Salem's Lot, so yeah. I'm curious about that I mean, one too. I'm kind of curious. I've not seen that either, honestly. Uh, but this movie, is, <laughs> it's a great no. Is it even really particularly memorable? No, but I, I love the way that it has the strong uh, generational influence of a guy who is haunted by the nuclear age, who grew up in that. You know, he was a small child during that time right. and uh, came about in the hippie revolution and went through all of that stuff and brought that influence into his career. And then he brings it back here, that nuclear, you know, hysteria and brings it back in this movie in a very unique way. Yeah, it sounds really neat, at least if nothing else. Uh, Angel Town, I believe we had that on our <laughs> Facebook page as well. Yes, indeed. Angel Town. Good God. Uh, somebody thought it would be a great idea, and this happened a lot in the 80s when somebody became successful in the field of martial arts. Somebody else would go, you need to be in a movie. <laughs> and so here we get French martial artist Olivier Grun- Gruner, who plays a uh, martial arts expert who is being brought to America to, uh, I think, teach the uh, uh, the American martial arts Olympics team, if such a thing exists. <laughs> He's going to go to a California college while he's there because he's uh, very he's super intelligent and he's got to be learning all the time. So he's going to go to college. Uh, but the only place he can find to live in California is in this uh, stereotype-ridden barrio <laughs> where everybody's a gang member. And the gang members are constantly attacking everybody. And he's got to karate them to save the, the two good people who – the three good people who live in in the town. One of the first things you see in this movie is what is like it's definitely like a foreigner's idea of what gang wars are like, <laughs> which is so fucking funny because you got like three different racist gangs like getting together to punch each other in a field. 
and then and then one of them just pulls out an Uzi. And that's it. There's only one gun in the movie. One gun in the entire movie, and it's this is one Uzi that looks like a spray painted squirt gun. Just never gets used. Could have ended the movie right there. So, but then we 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 slam cut from that to Olivier Gruner's introduction. He's going up to a grave to say goodbye to his father because he's leaving to go to California. And suddenly this limousine pulls up, and this woman, this very attractive woman, gets out wearing this this uh, this you know very expensive coat, you know like knee length coat. And she comes running up to him, and she can't believe I can't believe you're leaving. You can't leave me like this. And he goes, I have to go. I have to follow my dreams and so she does she takes off the coat she's completely naked and they bone right there in the cemetery <laughs> right on dad's grave just going right to the bone zone right on dad's grave yeah. <laughs> when it's time I'm... this movie is awful it's awful in the most wonderful way this is an enjoyable kind of awful as opposed to the other awful we're going to talk about Oracula. Oh my God! That's not enjoyable or awful. Not at all. It's an enjoyable title. Oh God, I hate this movie. This is a this is a black hole of suck from which no joy can come. Honestly, <laughs> that's how awful this movie is. Uh, Rockula stars Dean Cameron, who I've, I've dubbed the dollar store leading man. Uh, <laughs> the dollar store brand leading man. Uh, he plays a, a four hundred three three or four hundred year old vampire who uh, is a virgin and is named Ralphie, and, and Tony Basil is his mom. Uh, he, his best friend is a mirror version of himself that lives inside of a mirror and is a ladies' man version of himself in an opposite world, I guess. I don't know. It's fucking stupid. The sheer volume of cocaine that went into making this movie cannot be understated because that's really the only way to explain any of the choices that get made uh, throughout this movie. It's a musical. Um, basically, he's cursed uh, to fall in love every 22 years with the same girl who comes of age at the age of 22 and is falls in love with him and is subsequently murdered by pirates somehow. <laughs> in this version of herself in 1990, she's a rock chick. So he decides the best way to woo her is to become a rocker. So he starts a band called Rockula, because the gimmick is that he's a vampire. The movie is so clumsy that we have no idea whether everyone knows he's a vampire or doesn't know he's a vampire. Do they think it's just a gimmick, or do they know he's an actual vampire? We don't know. The movie is so bad that it never establishes that. Or it didn't before I turned it off, because I was so (laughs) fucking pissed off. Because the first performance is this awful, like, power pop, Dracula, rock star song. The second song is this one of the most offensive things I've ever seen in my life. It is Dean Cameron doing a rap called Rapula. And the chorus is, he's the DJ, I'm the vampire. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was so mad. Because he's, he's talking. Because this is the choices that this movie makes, right? We've got Tony Basil in this movie. We've got Howard Jones in this movie. We've got Bo Diddley in this movie. And all of the singing is done by Dean Cameron. He's the one who does all the music in the movie. <laughs> he and his, this rock chick of his that's an, also just an actress, they do all the singing. <laughs> that's the choices that this movie makes. But one of, the wonder, one of the choices that this movie makes also is to have him have Dean Cameron Rock up to Bo Diddley, who's singing backup on this rap song. Bo Diddley is singing backup on this rap song. And he's in Bo Diddley's face going, are you dissing me, bro? Are you dissing me, bro? Over and over. Whew. What's Bo Diddley saying? Just, just uh, pay me? Just, I guess so. Wow. Yeah. It, it's so awful. It's so incredibly awful. They do a power ballad in the middle of this thing between the two of them. It's just, I mean, to, to define bland. I mean, it, it's it's bad, but in a way that is so unmemorable. This is such a weird time for me because I'm like, I now you're starting to get into that era where I remember the, these movies coming out. <laughs> yeah. And 
you know, there's like Hunter for October is coming out next week, 30 years ago, and that's like a movie I'll, I remember, and it's right. like a normal movie. Uh, to me, this is like an 80s movie that somehow made it into the 90s. <laughs> yeah, right? This and Angel Town, like they belong in 86. Right. So it's just, I don't know. It, it, I'm just kind of shocked. It's just weird to see. Even like Spontaneous Combustion has just seemed like a almost an 80s movie yeah. idea instead of a 90s movie, but... I don't know. Uh, Blood of the Heroes? Did you watch that I one? I didn't. That one was not available. Where the Home Is or Where the Heart Is? I can't remember what. That's the one with Uma Thurman, and I saw that years ago, and it was very charming when I saw it. Uh, Dabney Coleman plays a father to a very uh, odd family, a very odd artistic family that's going to, I think, lose their house. It's It's been a while since I've seen it, but... Uh, uh, all the Like I said last week, the, the memorable thing is you get to see a topless Uma Thurman. <laughs> Covered Which she's paint. not topless necessarily. She's covered in paint, but still, it's still exciting for to that. If art. you're if you're my age, you're 14 years old at that time. It was wonderful. And then mountain on the moon. Is that never heard? And not a word of that one. I didn't even buy. I don't even think I looked for that one. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week's very light. Uh, the Invisible Man is the only new release coming. Uh, there's our classic is the 1933 version of the Invisible Man. We confirm that that's available. We have not. We should probably do that. <laughs> I think there have been a number of versions of this. I know Chevy Chase did a version that wasn't called the Invisible Man, but it was, uh, or maybe it was. I don't know, but Chevy Chase did a version where he played an Invisible Man. Didn't Val Kilmer do a version of this? <laughs> I thought that no, he was the he was a different TV character. <laughs> Wait, the t- Invisible Man was a TV character at one point, I think. I think he might have made a remake of the TV show, I think. Huh. I don't I can't remember. Uh, it appears to be on Amazon, so if nothing else, we have it there. All right. Uh, the, 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 he was the saint. Val Kimmer was the saint. That wasn't an invisible character. Right. Uh, <laughs> for Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Kevin Bacon, yes, Hollow Man. Hollow Man. I knew I couldn't remember. That was. was a real piece of shit. That movie sucks. That's a little bit shoe, right? I think so. Was she yeah. in the Saint too? <laughs> she might have been. Ninety nine. I can't. That movie was made in nineteen ninety nine. That's one of the like that was the worst movie of that year. I think. Hollow Man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there is the the last thing he wanted on Netflix. We might watch that. Uh, maybe we'll decide to add more. You know, we've joked about doing more Cronenberg, maybe more Toby Hooper if we get really in- invested. Uh, in 1990, Decalogue, Rich Girl, and The Hunt for October, the only one I... <laughs> and uh, who knows, maybe set a bit Paradiso. <laughs> right. I could bring that one back. Never did get to it. Uh, who made that again? I was... Oh, never mind. I was listening to the podcast that, uh... Ronan Farrow did about the Harvey Weinstein thing, and Harvey Weinstein used Cinema de Paradiso to get to one of the girls. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. Yeah. Ugh. So, I didn't use, I mean, they, it was part yeah. of one of the conversations. Uh, but yeah, that's a fan, that's a tough listen, but an interesting one, if you yeah. like. It's just like nine episodes. Is the uh, story about Brad Pitt true that he told her that he was the one who said to Weinstein to leave Gwyneth Paltrow alone? I believe Gwyneth Paltrow said that. Okay. He said did that, but that's not part of the report. Uh, this is more about how – it's not so much about Harvey Weinstein as the book is, and that's about Trump as well, huh. but it's about NBC burying the story. Oh, okay. So, but it's just, and he brings all the sources on. It's a really good listen. It's, they're not long episodes. I mean, if you like shows like Serial, I'm not a big NPR person, uh, but this is a much, to me, a much better version of that. And it's more real. I don't know. It's like more mainstream too. So I can't recommend that enough. He's done. It was just a short yeah. nine episode thing. I like that. I like podcasts that do that. Like I'm, I'm listening to one right now, actually, that's a, a short term uh, one about, it just came out about the, the Delphi murders, uh, Delphi, Indiana, two teenage girls, uh, were murdered. Um, nobody has any, uh, any idea, but they caught a picture of the guy they think did it on Snapchat and they caught, uh, the girls being true crime fans themselves. Uh, they caught a, a portion, just a little bit of his voice. Really? Uh, say, and yeah, they were trying to film him, 
because uh, they were trying to protect themselves and or at least help people find them. And they caught a, just a snippet of his voice saying, down the hill. And that's what the podcast is called. It's called Down the Hill. Jeez. The Ronan Farrell podcast is called The Catch and Kill, uh, which was inspired by what Trump used to do with the National Enquirer. They would k- grab all the stories about him and he'd kill them. They'd buy them and then yeah. just not er- ever release them. Uh, even if they weren't true, yeah. it, it was just the fact that he, that's what he was doing, and that's kind of what got him in trouble. You know, nearly, <laughs> nearly got him in trouble. Got him more PR, bad PR. But that is next week. Uh, Invisible Man, Hunt for October, and maybe some other fun things. Uh, if I want to thank our Patreon supporters for supporting the show at our key grip level, Charlie Messing and Jason Bryan at our craft services level, Zach Kovemaker at our character actor level, Josh and Beth Paul, Cousin Jeff, and Christina Cato, and our special effects level, Corey Finneran. If you want to be a Patreon supporter, I hate critics on that slash Patreon. You can also pick up our podcast merch on our podcast merch tab. Uh, want to play flick chart? Yeah. All right, let me pull it up. Brother Bear, Braveheart. Braveheart? Yay. <laughs> and Interstellar, Walk the Line. Whew. Yeah, I, know, I, you, I know where you're going on this. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Walk the Line either, but I am going to go Walk the Line. Uh I, I like Interstellar a lot more than you do. I, I don't love it, but I think I like it more than Walk the Line. And flip it. Tails. Walk the line it is. Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, Matchstick Men. Oof. God, that's brutal. Um, oh, wait, no, I'm thinking of different. I'm thinking Matchstick Men is a good movie. That's with Nicolas Cage, right? Yes. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, that's a good movie. Okay, that one, yeah. I was thinking of that awful George Clooney movie that came out a few years ago. Oh, I need to watch the Hellboy movies because someone needs to defend them. I mean, Guillermo <laughs> del Toro seems to be like universally loved, but you and Josh did not care for him. Uh, Spider-Man 2, the same Raimi one, Point Break. Spider-Man 2, all the way. Definitely. Doctor Strange, Syriana. Syriana is really heavy and not fun to watch. No, it's not intended to be, but it's like... It's definitely like a homework movie, whereas Doctor Strange is a lot of fun. I'll go Doctor Strange. I'll go Syriana. I thought Doctor Strange was kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marvel's homework for you, so. Uh, <laughs> Tales. Syriana it is. Although, I mean, with, I'm, Syriana's not like, I don't know if it was like Traffic, which is kind of a homework movie, too. But <laughs> I enjoyed that homework. Right. Uh, Whiplash, Grindhouse. Whiplash. The Fly, 1986. Dune, 1984. Cronenberg versus Lynch. <laughs> <laughs> it's Dune, I guess. Sure. Which, which, what were the movies again? The Fly and Dune. Yeah, yeah I'd rather watch Dune. I, I can't stand The Fly. Casablanca, LA Confidential. Ooh, nice. Uh, it's Casablanca for me pretty easily, but I love LA Confidential. I mean, it's LA Confidential for me, but it should be Casablanca. <laughs> Do you want to flip? Yeah, go ahead. I feel bad flipping, though. <laughs> it's like when you know it's the better movie. Tails again. Jesus. You need to pick heads once more. <laughs> <laughs> you Only Live Twice and The Great Escape. Which oh uh, it's yeah a Bond movie yeah the Great Escape for me agreed the last King of Scotland Das Boot Das Boot really isn't that like four hours long it's it's a really engaging four hours <laughs> it's foreign <laughs> we watched it on the show I had a hard time getting through it. <laughs> Like homework's homework. <laughs> Flipping again? Yeah. Plus I really like his performance. And Heads. <laughs> I'm just winning everything. <laughs> Drive, never been kissed. Drive. Yeah. Ooh, this is going to be awesome. Not another teen movie, Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> 
I'll go with the non-racist one. <laughs> I assume it's non-racist, right? I don't remember being racist. Uh, or his breakfast at Tiffany's is incredibly racist. Jurassic World Hulk 2003. Jurassic World. Agreed. Batman 89, Dumb and Dumber 94. Batman. Agreed. Cars, The Lost Boys. Cars all the way. Fuck Lost Boys. Agreed. American Pie presents... Man, let's not do that one. If it was an actual American Pie movie... The that awkward moment, Hellboy two. Which one's that awkward moment? Miles Teller, uh, kind of a forgettable comedy. I can't think of who else is in it. Huh. I liked it more than Hellboy. I'm sure. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> uh, Drive me crazy. Uh, looks to be a Melissa Joan Hart movie <laughs> or Resident Evil Extinction. <laughs> Melissa Joan Hart, please. <laughs> Birdman, Patch Adams. Birdman all the way. Yeah, Superman 3, The Constant Gardener. Constant Gardener. That's a great movie. That's really underrated. Yeah. Godzilla, 98. Broken Arrow, 96. <laughs> broken Arrow. It's Broken Arrow, but... Only because Godzilla is super shitty. And Broken Arrow is kind of fun bad. Yeah. Dumb and Dumber, Footloose. Footloose? Yeah, I just... I'm not a big Dumb and Dumber guy. I mean, I get why it's funny, I guess. It's an easy watch. <laughs> sphere uh, from Russia with Love. You say Sphere or Fear? <sighs> Fucking like, make me do my lisp thing. I can't say it. The Michael Crichton movie, Sphere, with Sharon Stone, Dustin Sorry. Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to mock you. I know you're not mocking me. It's my own fault. Uh, so were I, they again? <laughs> 